Hello and welcome to the JSA Studio. I am your host, as always, Nathan. And today I'm going to be talking about the Detroit Lions. Once again, we're going to be wrapping up the position breakdowns today by finishing off with the defensive backfield or the D. Bees. Once again, this is a pre-recorded video, so if new information has come to light regarding injuries or potentially players that make the roster, I can't change what I said in the past. With the intro done and out of the way, there's only one thing left to say, and that's to ask you to like, comment, and subscribe. We're going to go ahead and start off with who I think will be the starting cornerbacks. These are the players that are going to play outside the numbers, generally speaking. That's what I mean when I say cornerback. Now, technically, people still call nickels cornerbacks as well as slot defenders nickelbacks, and that all kind of means corners, although sometimes they're listed at safeties. I don't know. It's all real confusing. But for me, when I'm talking, I am referring to strictly players on the edges of the defense. These are typically the two players furthest away from the center position, that is what I mean when I say corner. And I think the two starting outside corners are going to be Carlton Davis and Ennis Rakestraw. I believe Rakestraw right now is more ready to start and play than Terry and Arnold. And the general vibe I've gotten throughout the reportings of early training camp here is that Rake Straw is ahead of Terry and Arnold right now, which may or may not be a good thing, depending upon how you look at it. I look at it as a good thing. Terry and Arnold was somebody who two years ago was playing safety for Alabama, okay? This is someone very new to the cornerback position. He was always more of an upside pick, even though he actually had really good technique at Alabama. He just doesn't have the nuances of the position down yet. And that's the stuff that gets exposed when you transition from college to the NFL, more so than the other technical aspects of the game. And it's Rakestraw was more of a player that I felt like has a lower ceiling, maybe even by a large margin than Terry and Arnold, but I also thought he could come in and play right away. I had a top 50 grade on Rake Straw, I believe. Uh, had he ran a little bit better, it's possible I would have put him in the top 40. Now, information I did not know at the time until I heard Brett Coleman talk about it in his Detroit Lions offseason breakdown video was that Rake Straw was actually hurt. He was coming off of a hamstring sprain while running at the combine. So that 4 or 5 40 may not have been as indicative of his play speed as it should have been had he been fully healthy. And I get that there are a lot of people that talk about 40 yard dashes don't matter, and we're moving more towards in game speed with GPSs and all that sort of stuff. But the fact of the matter is, is that the 40 yard dash, especially for defensive backs, correlates with how good you are you don't want to be in the low four threes because generally those players aren't very good however you don't want to be in the four fives either so that's sort of what i would say four three eight to four four seven is the ideal area for a cornerback to be in and Arnold, and uh, to be fair to Ennis Rekestra, Arnold was also a little bit below that marker. However, I think, and this is just my rationale right now, it could definitely change in the future, but I think Rekestra, had he been healthy, would have been in that around that 4 4 5 range. I don't think Terry and Arnold ever would have gotten there. However, I think think it's very likely Terry and Arnold ends up being the future of the nickel position for this team, not necessarily as an outside cornerback. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit after we do the depth for the corners, which we're going to get into right now. Again, I do think Arnold could play on the outside. Uh, same with Amari Robertson. I think he's also going to be able to play on the outside if they ask him to do so. Uh, Kendall Vildor, who has gotten a lot of shit for no real reason. He 
played like a starting caliber corner for the Lions the vast majority of the time he was on the field. He had a bad NFC championship game. And it wasn't just that he could have had an interception that probably would have iced the game that bounced off his face mask and then Brandon Ayuk caught the ball. It's not just that. He had a bad game that game. However, I'm very excited to have him as a depth piece, assuming he makes the roster, because this is someone where when the injuries happen, because they're going to happen and they have to shuffle around the secondary a little bit, he can come off the bench and give you quality starting caliber minutes or not minutes, snaps. Sorry, I was watching the Olympic basketball game right before I sat down to record this. By the way, what a comeback by Team USA, semifinal match beat Serbia, even though I like Jokic. Glad the U.S. won. Move on to the gold medal match against France. Uh, anyway, getting back to this, Stephen Gilmore is the sort of last player that came out. Uh, I didn't make YouTube videos at the time, uh, but Stephen Gilmore, I had a draftable grade on him. I had a fifth-round grade on him. The Lions got him as a UDFA. I do think he is an NFL-caliber corner. Maybe not someone that's going to start or play a whole lot, but I do think he is a rosterable caliber corner. Moving on to the nickelback position, unfortunately, Emmanuel Mosley has been hurt once again with a season-ending pectoral injury, which is three straight years now. Um, I, I think there's a definitive possibility that Emmanuel Mosley has played his last snap in the NFL. And I don't want that to be the case because his first injury, which happened six or seven games into the, his last season with the 49ers, uh, now two seasons ago, before that injury, he was projected to get maybe even top of the market cornerback money. He was getting projected to get 17 to $19 million a year because he was not even above average. He was a good starting corner in the NFL with inside-outside versatility. And then he got hurt, had to sign the one-year deal with the Lions, got hurt again, the Lions brought him back, and now he's hurt again. And it's horrible. You hate to see stuff like this. But he's not going to be the starting nickel. I do think, had he been able to stay healthy, he probably would be the starting nickel. However, that's not what's going to happen. So, who are the contenders for the starting nickel spot with Emmanuel Mosley down? Ultimately, I do think it will be Amik Robertson. However, Terry and Arnold and Khalil Dorsey are likely to be not necessarily in competition with him, but the primary backups for the starting nickel, which I do think will be Amik Robertson. And... I don't know if it will be Terry and Arnold or not. It could be. They might want to put Robertson on the outside and kick Rake Estra to the bench. That is a definitive possibility. And then Arnold starts in the slot. I could see that happening fairly easily. Now, the Lions also do rotate their cornerbacks, which is not something a lot of teams do. But the Lions, when they had everybody this past season, they did rotate their corners a little bit. So I thought Robertson was going to get on the field anyway. But now I think he's likely just going to be the starting slot corner uh, on this team with Arnold being the primary backup at both the outside corner position and the nickel position in case one of the two starters gets hurt. Khalil Dorsey is the emergency. We have to throw somebody out there and we don't want to put Brian Branch there because for whatever reason we want him to play safety still. He's the emergency. We're going to throw you in the slot until we can figure something out next week sort of player there he's primarily a special teams player at this point and he's a elite caliber special teams player like the Lions have a lot of really really good special teams players so I think there's a very real possibility the Lions are going to field an elite special teams unit this year moving on to the safeties now the two starting safeties are pretty much locked in uh, and that is that it's going to be Brian Branch and Kirby Joseph now I in all honesty probably would just start Brian Branch in the nickel. Now that Emmanuel Mosley is hurt, that's probably what I would do. However, a lot of that is based off of the last six games of this past season, including the three playoff games, where Afatu Melanfanwu was quite legitimately playing like an all-pro caliber safety. If he can come close to matching that play, then I don't know how you can keep him on the bench. Like It's almost like you have to put Brian Branch back in the nickel 
in order to get Ify Mel and Fodmu onto the field. And maybe he's not playing at that level anymore. Maybe that was a flash in the pan because teams didn't know how to take account for him and they were surprised by his range or his ability to blitz or something like that. I don't know. Those are all definitive possibilities. However, I think he deserves to start and play based off of what I saw at the end of last season. All that being said, I do believe that Kirby Joseph did have a, a little bit of a sophomore slump this past year. Now, there were morons on Twitter that were posting GIFs of like the ESPN, like little bubbles where they show you what's going on during the play. And they show Kirby Joseph running off the screen 20 yards downfield. And they're like, who is Kirby Joseph covering? Those people do not deserve to have an opinion on the game of football. I don't remember who said it. Otherwise, I'd call them out. But when you're playing cover one or cover two, which the Lions did play a whole lot of cover two, but they did play a lot of cover one. But hypothetically, if you're a deep safety in either of those two schemes, you have to be 20 yards down the field minimum in case there's a double move, in case there's somebody running a post on the backside that you don't see. So he's doing his job. And some people on the internet were fucking stupid and said, what is he doing? I can't believe he's playing this poorly when he wasn't playing this poorly. Now, another big problem with Kirby Joseph. This is something that it's not just a problem with the Lions, but this is something that a lot of teams do. They find themselves a not necessarily elite caliber, like true free safety, deep safety. But this happens all the time with players who were just, you know, good deep safeties. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, hey, you're a good player. Let's stop having you do the things you're good at and make you come down and play in the box and cover tight ends. They did this with Tracy Walker in his second year with Matt Patricia, and it was horrible. He was one of the worst players in the NFL that year, according to PFF. And then guess what? In Tracy Walker's third year, they moved him back to free safety, and he was a good starting free safety for the Lions that year. I think the same thing's going to happen with Kirby Joseph. I don't want to see Kirby Joseph in the box. I don't want to see him in the slot. I don't want to see him do anything other than play center field and cover one, cover three, or a split safety look and cover four, or cover two. That's all I want to see Kirby Joseph do. I don't want to see him 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. Because guess what? When they moved him back to that role later on in the season, guess what happened? He started making plays and he ended up with four interceptions just like his rookie year. So just let him be a center fielder out there just let him play deep that's what he's good at because he has elite caliber range for the position but for whatever reason these defensive coordinators just get it in their head and they're just like i'm gonna stop asking you to do the shit that you're good at and ask you to do a bunch of stuff that we already have players that can do better than you ever could anyway and we don't have anybody that can play center field like you do anyway even when we had Chauncey Gardner-Johnson this past year. Kirby Joseph was a better cover person than Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Gardner-Johnson made his money working in the box and the slot. So I don't understand that decision a whole lot either. But anyway, my rant about Kirby Joseph has taken up enough time of this video. Let's move on to Brian Branch. Brian Branch is going to play more safety this year. That's been the early reports. And I am kind of excited for it. However, again, kind of touching on the Kirby Joseph stuff again. I don't necessarily believe in expanding a player's role to a full-ass different position when they were arguably one of the four or five best players at their position this past season. Like, Brian Branch got all pro votes as a nickel corner in the NFL as a rookie. So, I like, maybe he can go to safety and just be a Pro Bowl caliber safety. If that's true, then move him to safety because that's a more valuable position than nickel corner. However, if you end up moving him to safety and he's either average or below average, like what happens a lot of the time when you start moving defensive backs around, then you may end up ruining his development as a potential all-pro caliber nickel corner. So I guess we just have to see how Brian Branch transitions to the safety position, although it's probably not something I would have done. All right, moving on to the depth at the safety position. The primary depth is going to be uh, Ify Melanfonbu and I think probably Khalil Dorsey as the other backup safety. 
Uh, I do think C.J. Moore, who is coming off of a year-long gambling suspension, is someone that is going to have a very good chance to make the roster because of the special team's upside. And to be honest with you, two years ago when he was on the team, when he came in in spot fill-in duty as a safety, and he even played in the slot a little bit, he wasn't that bad. He wasn't a liability. And when we're getting down to like third or fourth on the depth chart, you not being a liability is really, really good. So I like CJ Moore as a player. I like the fact that he's an elite special teams player. I like the fact that Khalil Dorsey is a very, very good to borderline elite special teams player as well. Brandon Joseph is someone that was getting first round hype while he was at Northwestern, decided to transfer to Notre Dame, which was a dumb decision. And then he didn't even get drafted but he is someone that has legit size for the position i think he has good range i think he's someone that gives you versatility uh he would not surprise me if he ended up making the roster outright as a defensive back speaking of players that are going to make the roster outright these are the players that i believe are in the roster full stop uh, Carlton Davis, Terrian Arnold, Ennis Rakestra, Amik Robertson, Kirby Joseph, Brian Branch, and Iffy Mellon Fonboy. I would be shocked and astonished beyond measure if any of these players were cut. As far as guys that I think are probably in, I would say Kendall Vildor and Khalil Dorsey are probably in. I would lean in for them as opposed to them getting cut. Guys that are on the roster bubble are 50-50 type of players. C.J. Moore, Stephen Gilmore, Brandon Joseph, and Maurice Norris, who has reportedly been making a whole lot of plays in camp so far. If I had to guess, I would say only one of those four players make the roster. I don't necessarily see the Lions keeping 11 defensive backs. That could be the case. They could decide that they want the depth there. However, I think they're going to value the special teams productivity of their linebackers and defensive linemen a little bit more than the secondary right now. So if I had to guess, I would say Kendall Vildor, Khalil Dorsey both make the roster and CJ Moore as well with Stephen Gilmore, Brandon Joseph, and Maurice Norris being very strong practice squad candidates. But that's just me, and what do I know? I'm just some asshole on the internet giving you his opinion. And it's at this point in the video that I would like to remind you to like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to see more content like this, and if you disagree with me at any point, or you just have something to say, go ahead and drop a comment down in the comment section below. And now with the outro done and out of the way, there's only one thing left to say, and that's that I'll see you next time.